if you haven't still um, read about uh, Acker or Sete, uh, let me uh, put you up to up to date. It's also on uh, some other you know uh, publications uh, such as Bitcoin Magazine on Twitter. So let me give you the short version first. First of all, welcome to the Kevin Tamari Kevin Davani Connection Show. It's all Bitcoin and all the other topics related and connected to Bitcoin. So the Norwegian energy company Acker, uh, I think I pronounced incorrectly, forms Bitcoin subsidiary, holds $58 million in Bitcoin treasury. The Norwegian energy company Acker is A, has formed a new subsidiary dedicated to Bitcoin. The subsidiary Sete will hold all the liquid assets in Bitcoin. Bitcoin only currently $58 million worth. We have, as of March 9th, 2021, uh, the Bitcoin price approximately around 43, 44,000 uh, euros. Don't know the uh, dollar denomination. And it goes on, it will invest and participate in Bitcoin ecosystem. CETE, the new subsidiary of Acker, the energy company, plans to spin up Bitcoin mining operations, a natural fit for the energy giant, but also intends to develop Bitcoin-related software, potentially based on block streams products and other lightning networks. So very bullish, very exciting. And to quote Acker's billionaire chairman, Kiel Inge Roque, he explained, we aim to increase the capitalization significantly over time as we gain experience and identify exciting opportunities. I'm fascinated by the prospect of Bitcoin Lightning wallets that may enable instant credit via micropayments without the need to offer personal information that my counterpart can monetize without approval or compensation. I'm pretty sure he's, a, he's alluding to uh, Jack Mueller's strike where he also mentioned that uh, very thoroughly in his shareholders letter, which I'm gonna uh, come to later on. Additionally, Mr. Roque published a shareholders letter, which outlines both the motivation and thought process around CETA and Arker's commitment to Bitcoin, as well as the products and services they may develop. So, you know, it's becoming mainstream. It's becoming more widely acceptable. Bitcoin is a, as a asset class, as a unique, pristine asset class, as a pristine collateral, as a pristine, you know, money, uh, with absolute scarcity and more and more companies, you know, with the square MicroStrategy, uh, Tesla with $1.5 billion, uh, Tesla, you know, going, it's nothing, it's still nothing. It's, it's a really tiny drop, but, you know, we're going to experience hyper Bitcoinization within the next, uh, you know, years to come. And it will be, we are a super bullish, exciting journey here. And it says here that, uh, so more and more companies that may not be directly financial nature will likely find, find touch points into the Bitcoin ecosystems. Okay. Um, and Acker and Sete clearly see Bitcoin not only as investment, but as a platform and ecosystem on which to build new products and services. Uh, let me go, before we go to the shareholders letter, let me uh, read you the latest update. Um, NYDIG raises $2 million from strategic partners. Additional capital comes amid dramatic acceleration of Bitcoin adoption via NYDIG from traditional financial services firms. So the short version is NYDIG, alerting a leading provider of technology and investment solutions for Bitcoin today announced that's of March 8th, 2021 on prnews.com. Uh, PR announced a $200 million growth capital round led by strategic partners, Strongreach, Strong Rich Holdings Group. Uh, if you haven't read the shareholders letter by Stephen Ross of Stone Rich, you should definitely do that first before reading the, the shareholders letter of uh, Kiel uh, Roque of the chairman founder of Acker. Uh, doesn't really matter in which order, but just read it. It's really uh, mind blowing. Morgan Stanley, New York Life, uh, Mass Mutual, Source Fund Management, FS Investments, Bessemer Venture Partners and FinTech Collective who led the two prior funding rounds for NY, NYDIG, who are also significant participants. As an example of accelerating institutional Bitcoin adoption, NYDIG also announced today that life, annuity, and property and casualty insurers now own in aggregate more than $1 billion direct and indirect Bitcoin exposure facilitated exclusively by NYDIG and held on NYDIG secure audited and insured institutional custody platform. Now, just, uh, and by the way, that's, that is Ross founder, uh, Ross, that is Ross Stevens, founder and executive chairman of NYDIG continued. I'm thrilled by what this group of incredible investors will mean for NYDIG, but especially for Bitcoin. Now, um, 
uh, and again, NYDAG provides Bitcoin investment technology solutions to insurers, banks, corporations, institutions, and HNW individuals, high net worth individuals. The firm and its products meet the industrial's highest regulatory audit and government governance standards. Now you got to imagine, you got to imagine what you know what happens when other huge institutions come in, especially when global pension funds come in. <laughs> with with their whatever 50 70 trillion dollars assets under management okay so uh let me go to the uh first part of the shareholders um uh letter of um of uh, Acker's, uh chairman founder uh kiel roke mr kiel inge roke let me screen share this for you okay and there it goes. So again, I'm, I hesitate to read the, everything because it would just go, uh, you know, would be too, too lengthy. So dear shareholders, today we announced that Acker has established CETE, a new company that will invest in exciting projects and companies throughout the Bitcoin ecosystem while keeping all these liquid investable assets in Bitcoin. And it goes on, before I proceed with our story, I want to state upfront that I'm aware that Bitcoin is often criticized for a number of perceived challenges. Now, what I like is his approach, he, 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 he dismantles, he smashes, you know, he, he disassembles all the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, doubt, you know, the attempts to discredit Bitcoin and all that bullshit that's been going on. Including its electricity consumption, its, its inability to scale with respect to transactions and its potential to facilitate anonymous, illegitimate payments. We believe that Bitcoin can be a solution rather than a problem for each of those, but we will get to the arguments for that later. CT's strategy is threefold. First, we will use Bitcoin as our treasury asset and join the community. In Bitcoin speak, we will be hodlers. We will be different, but additive, perhaps not as rebellious as the cypherpunks who invented Bitcoin. Now, don't forget, you know, he's in a position like Michael Saylor, uh, CEO, you know, chairman, founder of a huge institutions corporation, and he cannot, like, even if he wanted to, I think, you know, they cannot just go and really uh, emphasize the essence of Bitcoin, namely the separation of money and state, making the whole criminal, you know, the, the beyond criminal activities of the nation state governments, inclusion with central banks and the military industrial corporate complex obsolete and all that. Okay, but you can read my uh, articles on medium.com slash at Davani. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, by the way, and uh, read my articles. Thank you so much. But much more progressive than most established corporates. The team at CETE is already running open source Bitcoin payment servers and will remain active contributors in the community. Second, CETE will establish mining operations that transfer stranded or intermittent electricity without stable demand locally, wind, solar, hydropower to economic assets that can be used anywhere. Bitcoin is, in our eyes, a load balancing economic battery, and batteries are essential to the energy transition. Required, you know, about this whole climate stuff, you know, this whole climate hysterical stuff. Third, we will build and invest on projects and companies in Bitcoin's ecosystem. This is where our true passion is. Our home game is industrial applications, but we we'll also believe, but we we'll also believe nicely designed modern use. User interfaces will enable new applications wherever transactions happen. I'm particularly interested in micropayments and how these may enable us to avoid usernames, passwords, and our personal data being monetized with and off without our knowledge or consent. Acker is part of the industrial establishment. As someone who started my career in the engine room of old fishing trawlers outside the coast of Norway and later in the Bering Sea in the United States, I'm immensely proud of what Acker has become, including the newly formed industrial partnerships we have recently announced. But all large companies have one thing in common. They were once small. And many large companies are victims of their own success and end up small or defunct. I will do everything I can to keep Acker curious, innovative, and able to keep up with the times. After 40 years in business, I've learned that you always have to keep an eye out for new opportunities and developments on the horizon. CETE marks the horizon. It positions itself in the middle of an industry that could define the next several decades, much like the internet has done since the early 1990s. CETE is an open invitation to push, pull, and poke life as we know it, to act like young entrepreneurs every day. And it goes on, you know, all the, you know, the prolific Bitcoiners uh, that he has, uh, you know, that they gained their collective knowledge from, derived from extens uh, extensively, uh, you know, such as Adam Beck, uh, Andres Antonopoulos, Nick Carter, uh, and so on. 
Jack Mullis, uh, Chamat Palipabtaya, Anthony Pam Pampliano, Pierre Rochard, Michael Saylor, and so on and so on. Some of the people mentioned above are not believers in Bitcoin are agreement with our investment thesis. I mean, these are the names I did not mention, <laughs> to be honest with you, like Ray Dalio. We like to dive into competing narratives and mention them here in case the reader wants to dive into the proverbial rabbit hole. It's amazing to see the cryptocurrency space, as he calls it, attract so many intelligent people of young generations, much like the internet did when it was in its infancy. And it goes on, it says, um, uh, Bitcoin was invented in 2009 and will go through waves of development before it achieves the application maturity that we are now used to on the internet. It's a testament of our times that the internet has given many of us instant access to information, but the real value comes when we let our curiosity navigate Beyond the algorithm for recommended content, you can only challenge preconceived ideas when you're willing to go outside of your comfort zone. Bitcoin has inspired us to challenge our intuitive understanding of money. Having followed the cryptocurrency discourse for a while, I mean, again, there's a Bitcoin and there's shit coins. We decided to reach out to the engineers who made it their mission to change the inner workings of money more than two decades ago. This morning, we are also prou proudly announced that SETE has formed a partnership with Blockstream, a global leader in Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Blockstream's leadership includes Adam Back, the inventor of Hashcash, who has been, by the way, who was cited in the white paper of the pseudonymous Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, it, they was, a 1997 precursor of Bitcoin, uh, that's Hashcash. With Blockstream as our partner, we are confident that we can navigate this industry. Not investing is the riskiest decision. Risk is not an obvious concept. What's commonly considered risky is frequently not, and vice versa. We are used to thinking that cash is risk-free, but it's not. It's implicitly taxed by inflation at a small rate every year. It adds up. Central bankers have magically agreed that they should target 2% inflation. That's what they're what, what we are told, of course, the official inflation rate and the consumer price index and all the fraud and deception that's been going on, which implies that one third of your money's worth is taxed every 20 years. If it was 3%, almost half of it would be gone in that time. Now you should ask, why is it two and not one or three? What's special about 2%? The Federal Reserve has recently said it will target an average rate of 2% over time, which implies they will allow inflation to run above the target for some years. Inflation is very good for debtors, and the US is the world's largest debtor. They owe the bond owners. They owe pensions. Both groups may be out of luck in the long term. And then it goes on, on and... So what's risk? It's all relative. In 2018, Twitter hashtag got, get off zero started to circulate. The main argument, it may be irresponsible not to include some exposure to Bitcoin given the asymmetric return properties. Even if you don't get the underlying cypherpunk and libertarian ideals, which I think you should because it's a structural uh, uh, root uh, solution, which I find most interesting, you still need to consider the potential diversification benefits of Bitcoin. Schmuck insurance, in the words of social capitals, Chamat Palipapadaya. And then it goes on and on. Uh, I'm not going to read all this. Uh, and then it says, and it will probably happen again. And what happens if the central banks cannot stop the fall? What happens to the monetary system if people start questioning the stability of the reserve currency? Again, this has happened many times in history. I respond to today's challenges as I would when I was a young man. I will always prefer to be a focused entrepreneur rather than a diversified investor. I'll buy it with a tad bit more risk management and infinitely more academic rigor around me than I had early in my career. One of my favorite questions to people who ask me about the risk that's inherent to our ideas. What about the risk of losing out on the upside? Young professionals know they're risking their careers if they say yes to what eventually becomes bad investments. That's the name of the game. What you should really get fired for is saying no and losing out to once in a lifetime opportunities. And then, of course, uh, uh, rhetorically, he says Bitcoin may still go to zero, but it can also become the core of a new monetary architecture. If so, one Bitcoin may be worth millions of dollars. Of course, he's still thinking in fiat denominator. So I'm saying don't think in fiat denominator. I mean, Bitcoin is its own beast in its own it's its own legend because of its absolute scarcity and because it cannot be stopped, uh, it cannot be banned. So even, you know, what is it? I mean, even if it's, it goes to hundred million dollars, what what does the dollar mean actually by then? You know, uh, by then we'll probably have it will be worthless or so hyperinflation, whatever. So anyway, um, 
we need to think really in purchasing power. That's what I'm saying. This asymmetry is interesting for portfolio. People who know the most about Bitcoin believe its future success is nearly inevitable, whereas the other camp thinks that its failure, that its failure is equally certain. Status quo is not possible. In the past months, I have met many new people. One of them was Jack Muller at Strike. He's almost 40 years younger than me. Experiencing his energy and enthusiasm was special. I felt old in his company, but also very emboldened. I lost out on mobile communications. I didn't invest in internet companies. It was only recently that I started to invest in and build software companies. And I love it when I realized how much brain power goes into Bitcoin. I saw the future in the making. Okay, so goes on and on and uh, I will read some other passages. Yeah, and then he, you know, dismantles all the FUD, which is really beautiful about, you know, how much electricity is using and, and you know, and speculative bubble and all this bullshit that's been going on. Um, and then it says, if you subscribe to the bubble narrative, you can rest safely knowing that the electricity consumption of Bitcoin will return to zero in the near future. Miners will not expend energy if the Bitcoin rewards are rendered worthless. If that's your view, the discussion. What if Bitcoin replaces gold as an asset class for portfolio diversification and store value? Now, to all the gold barks out there, this is not our prediction. Thousands of years of history as sound money means gold will likely remain attractive. Well, I don't agree with that, but anyway, I think it will be reduced eventually to, you know, industrial usage, and uh, we will find more and more gold. You know, if you pour, if we put more energy, resource, and special technological innovation into finding Bitcoin, whether it's be on planet Earth or anywhere, asteroids or anywhere, Mars, or whatever, uh, new subnuclear technologies. We merely use this example to show that Bitcoin scarcity would would be sufficient, and environmental price would be much lower. Also, to be clear, this scenario is not why we're excited about Bitcoin, but it may be the easiest use case to understand. Current gold production is around 3,000 tons a year against an inventory of about 200,000 tons, which is all the gold that has been produced throughout history. Of that, less than half is used for jewelry. The so-called stock flow ratio, which is a measure of scarcity, where a higher number is better, is therefore currently around 56. At the current rate of production, it would take 56 years. It would take 56 years to double the inventory. What's the comparable scarcity of Bitcoin? The current block reward is 6.25 Bitcoin, which translates to about 900 new Bitcoins every day or 328,500 per year, given 18.6 million Bitcoin in existence. The stock to flow is currently approximately 56, which is on par with gold. But after the next halving, which is to, uh, which will happen during the spring of 2024, the stock will be higher and the flow will be lower. So stock to flow will be more than double that of gold. Bitcoin will be much scarcer than our scarcest commodity. And it goes on, you know, about Bitcoin CO2, you know, all this uh, stuff. Uh, and let me. Uh, we obviously cannot know how this play out. Many technologies will, will complete to, to solve these talent challenges, but we do know that many applications are too important to leave the verification to centralized systems owned by a corporation or controlled by a single country. Clearly, the protocol is designed to cut the rewards in half every four years or so. Miners will only expend electricity if it remains profitable. 18.6 million of the maximum 21 million Bitcoins exist today. So at the end of this year, 90% of Bitcoin is already in existence and paid for. Nine-tenths of the infrastructure is there. Since the block reward goes down significantly over time, the miners would be willing to expend less electricity, all things equal. Either the variable transaction fees or the price of Bitcoin have to increase substantially to compensate the miners. Since the block reward will approach zero, fees are the only viable long-term compensation mechanism. Since the transaction volume cannot increase given Bitcoin's design, fee increases imply that the value of single transactions must be substantially higher than today. Presumably, that's only possible if every transaction on the main chain always involves very large amounts. Billions of, of smaller transactions would have to execute with acceptable security in second layers and side chains. Again, all of this is only commercially and economically viable if the value of, ter of verifying Large transactions without a trusted third party is sufficiently high. This implies high demand for the network's architecture, which again means that useful applications that create tremendous value have been built on top of the core network. Bitcoin can therefore only survive and electricity will only be consumed if the value created by the network is sufficient. Even completely disregarding Bitcoin acting as an economic battery 
that may improve the economics of renewable projects, which could accelerate the installation of intermittent sources of electricity. We don't see a long-term problem related to Bitcoin's electricity consumption. If it's a bubble, if it was a bubble at all, it dies and consumes nothing. If it's digital gold, it's more efficient and will emit much less than the asset it disrupts. I mean, not to mention all the you know human human disaster, the slavery, the environmental uh, damages, uh, and 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 on and on the toxicity and stuff like that. And if it's really successful, it's because of demand from truly value creating applications that define our future and should be worth the electricity. Fine, but how will it scale? It is true that the Bitcoin mechanism. Uh, it, it is true that the Bitcoin main chain cannot process the number of transactions that we depend on in modern society on its main chain. But that's because Satoshi Nakamoto's design didn't trade censorship resistance and security for scalability. So scalability has to be solved by making slight trade-offs. Bitcoin doesn't compromise. To ensure it's open and secure, resistant to censorship and retroactive edits, it's decentralized, but that's a major drawback for scalability. Keeping one central spreadsheet up to date is obviously more efficient than having numerous copies that all must be updated. A Bitcoin transaction takes about 10 minutes to be confirmed and the design capacity is about seven transactions per second. Hard and sufficient to deal with today's transaction volumes. But when I heard Jack Mullers talk about the lightning layer, I had another Rossellini moment. He's talking about Strike. The Lightning Network is built on top of Bitcoin to make it scale. Transactions are done in bilateral channels that connect in a network, and each channel is anchored to Bitcoin's main chain with a single transaction. Lightning transactions complete in milliseconds and can process millions per second with hardly any use of electricity. It therefore leverages Bitcoin security while increasing speed and reducing cost to levels not achievable by legacy payment rails. Does a global distributed network of bilateral payment channels sound impossible? In fact, that's how spot foreign exchange works. Acker is the largest investor in Abilie, a non-bank liquidity provider in the foreign exchange market. We have spent a lot of time learning about the microstructure of financial markets. It's only a matter of time before the old and the new world of money is seamlessly connected. On that night, with all of us on video from Chicago, Tel Aviv, and Oslo, Mullers sent dollars from a regular bank account in the US via a wallet in Tel Aviv and further on to Oslo. Then for fun, we send it to an Acre colleague in Accra, Ghana. All of these transactions took place instantaneously at a nearly no cost. This creates a possibility of programmable microtransactions, a payment stream which can unlock limitless opportunities. Applications will have different needs and people will be willing to make slight trade-offs to achieve those. I'm certain that with time and creativity, applications that scale in sidechains and layers on top of Bitcoin will flourish. This ecosystem can provide massive scalability and will only need to settle with the main chain now and again, like getting a stamp of approval from the source of absolute truth. As such, we believe Bitcoin will scale brilliantly in layers upon layers that make the trade-offs applicable to particular application. And as we will see in the next paragraphs, it may provide the opportunity to build an entirely new architecture for how information flows in society. Still, doesn't Bitcoin enable undesired activities? Okay, so it goes, you know, all the, he smashes all the, you know, disassembles all the FUD. Um, on the other hand, it says somewhere down the line, he says, on the other hand, as has been so eloquently exposed by Shoshona Zuboff in her book, The Age of Surveillance Cap Capitalism, the internet behemoths, behemoths have turned us into the product. I'm certain we need to fight back against unlawful access to information that requires a new architecture. On a personal note, I'm frequently frustrated that I give away usernames, passwords, locations, credit card details, and other information to read newspapers or watch movies. I'm fascinated by the prospect of Bitcoin Lightning wallets that may enable instant credit via micropayments without the need to offer personal information that my counterpart can monetize without approval or compensation. So. If you insist on being anonymous, doesn't that mean you're hiding from the law? Of course not. To the contrary, I believe Bitcoin holds the promise of much more sophisticated KYC, know your customer, and AML, anti-money laundering, procedures and evils access when there is legal grounds, but keeps everything anonymous in all other circumstances. Now, what he doesn't mention, of course, and I, I understand his position, you know, he's a CEO, founder, chairman, whatever of, of Acker, 
And, uh, you know, I mean, we need to emphasize the, the, the grand uh, criminality that's going on on the central banking and, and, and commercial banking level globally. I mean, uh, approximately two, $2 trillion dollars uh, are being money laundered of all kinds of criminal activities, would it be, you know, the military industrial complex, weapons, drugs, uh, uh, human trafficking, and all that. After all, the legacy banking system of themselves are arcane, complex, and vulnerable, which means there's room for innovation. Lastly, let's also remember that the current system doesn't work for everybody. As a businessman in my 60s, I have access. The current system works relatively well from my perspective. But what about the poor but hardworking farmer? What about the billions of unbanked that have no way of accessing a bank account, much less credit to build their lives? From their perspective, what we have today clearly doesn't work. And the regulatory patchwork makes it even harder for them. It's unacceptable. Bitcoin's protocol should enable an ecosystem of applications that may change that because many more people will have access to mobile phones and the internet than have access to traditional financial infrastructure. And then it goes on to the chapter, progress is inevitable with a, uh, so I'm gonna you know, scroll a little bit further. And what I love is that he also uh, refers to the what, what the fuck happened, 971.com website. Uh, you know, from uh, Ben Prentice and uh, what's his uh, uh, heavily armed clown. Uh, let me just scroll down a little bit. Scarcity. Yeah, we need progress, says, and then says scarcity drives prices. Whether we talk about watches or guitars, wine or cars, painting or sculptures, all physical assets. Making digital assets used to mean it could be copied for free. Not anymore. Bitcoin can be verified, divided reassemble, stored, and transported at virtually no cost. It's the perfect scarce digital asset by design. All that's required to keep the network running is allocating the cheapest electricity in the world. Electricity, electricity secures the network. No trusted parties or people with guns are needed. I call that progress. Like gold, Bitcoin has the ability to protect us against politicians and other you know, puppets who have the power to destroy a monetary base. Is that really necessary, you might ask? Ask Soviet pensioners whose policies are still honored by the Russian government, although the value of those payments is bupkis because of hyperinflation in the 1990s. Strike up a conversation with a Turkish worker next time you are on vacation and ask how it feels to have your currency depreciate by almost 50% against the dollar in a single year. It has happened. It happens and will happen again, as you can see in all these countries, Turkey, Iran, Venezuela, where, wherever you, you can look, or African nations. I mean, we're talking about real hype inflation, and not only inflation. Many argue that governments may ban Bitcoin or that new regulation will destroy it. While it, while it would require new global coordination, which seems implausible, we cannot disregard that the introduction of more friction for adoption, for example, a ban on exchanges to limit people's ability to buy or sell would make the asset less attractive. But we, we remain unconvinced and believe that proper regulation may actually increase interest in cryptocurrencies as it calls it, as institutions can participate. There's only Bitcoin, no shit coins, but that's my comment. Let us also remember that new financial applications that may be enabled by Bitcoin can improve lives. According to the World Bank, more than half of the global population has access to the internet today and coverage is increasingly Rap is increasing rapidly. Just think of Starlink, you know, of uh, Elon Musk, uh, SpaceX, and, and 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 all that. The satellite, you know, infrastructure in the building with with super gigabytes per whatever second. Still, billions of people cannot ac get access to a bank account, and even if they can, it's costly, cumbersome, and slow. The current system mostly works, at least for privileged people in our part of the world. But banks remain inaccessible institutions for many. Let us all hope that can change. The direction is clear. Finance will be disrupted as surely as fossil fuels will be. The question is not if, but when. But I will offer two quotes as a reminder. Uh, and then and he quotes, you know, Hendrik Ibsen, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And for those who are already convinced, recall late singer-songwriter Tom Petty's lyrics and remember that the, right, that the waiting is the hardest part. Joining the community, um, 
And then he says, I realized that in some ways, Acker is very late to this space. Obviously, some people understood the potential of this invention many years ago. But in so many other ways, it is, as is demonstrated in everyday conversations with other people in business, we are also relatively early. My mind spins as I'm thinking about the opportunities and potential of the space. No doubt there will be disappointments. No doubt there will be hardships. And there will always be surprising twists and turns. We believe the Bitcoin network is a real first move advantage. Social adaptation will determine the future of it on a wider scale. People who are a lot smarter than us believe that Bitcoin can increase in value by 10 or even 50 times in the coming years. I mean, that's an understatement, in my opinion. Given the huge lead, we are not convinced that other, as he calls it, cryptocurrencies can challenge Bitcoin, given the strong network effects. However, there is no such thing as certainty, so we will remain painfully alert and passionately curious. In any case, we have to expect a lot of volatility, but we don't care because we believe in long-term functionality. We would never recommend relatives and friends to invest everything they have in Bitcoin. It is a good rule of some to remember that there's uncertainty in everything. It's like a trial. But I mean, my humble opinion, you know, if if Bitcoin does not succeed and we don't, you know, experience hyper Bitcoinization, the rooting of Bitcoin in every layer and dimension in our uh, planetary civilization, we are fucked anyway. But that's my opinion after my research. If you look at everything, the centralized structures, what's going on, nation state, governments, military industrial corporate complex, uh, you know, the fraud, the corruption, the uh, the the wars, the, the slaughtering, and everything that's going on the surveillance and all, and all that. So you can be 100% sure that you're correct, but even then it is hardly more than 80% certain that you're right. The lawyers call it litigation, litig litigation risk. Acker is the first major company in Scandinavia to allocate capital to Bitcoin. We're not going to be the last. We don't claim to know everything about the subject. And as we have learned something, we realize that the concept of money is in essence somehow unknowable and constantly changing. Niels Bohr, the Danish Nobel Prize winner who made significant contributions to our understanding of atomic structure once said about quantum mechanics, if you think you understand it, that only shows you don't know the first thing about it. Perhaps money is the same, but we're eager to learn more. Again, uh, follow uh, Robert Breelove on YouTube, Twitter, and uh, listen and watch his uh, YouTube series, Sailor series, What is Money? Really, Highly fascinating. And all these other you know, interviews with Jeff Booth, uh, it's, uh, it's been in the making. And we're truly excited about the prospect of being part of a community that is so full of talent, intelligence, creativity, ambition, youth. We can provide access to real life industrial problems that may be difficult to access elsewhere. We're also curious and eager to learn. And more importantly, when we believe in something or someone, we're prepared to look like idiots for extended periods of time. In the words of the late Norwegian politician, Aina Forde, a brilliant rhetoric who represented the Labour Party, you have to put yourself in the position to be labeled an idiot now and then, or else life would become too boring. <laughs> what a sense of humor, love it. But we are not alone in seeing a new monetary architecture on the horizon. Last year, Bitcoin made significant progress towards becoming a mainstream investment. When investors with indisputable track records like Paul Tudor Jones, and Stanley Druckenmiller disclosed that they have significant positions. Everybody with a curious brain should pay attention. Companies like Tesla, Mass Mutual, MicroStrategy, and Square have flagged positions, while Fidelity, BlackRock, Morgan Stanley, and other asset management behemoths are working to launch investment products for cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, which would make it easier for investors. Again, there's only Bitcoin. Uh, no, and no shit coins, okay? And you can put everything on the second, third, fourth layer on the Bitcoin's protocol and infrastructure on Bitcoin and within Bitcoin, my opinion. We believe Bitcoin is, to be, is going to be on the right side of history, but we should remind ourselves that some will resist forcefully. Norway was the last country in Europe to adopt color TV in 1972, several years after technology was available. The brilliant Aina Forde famously addressed the Norwegian Constituent Assembly and said, Protesting color TV is equivalent to saying we accept this, this, that sin has come to earth, but we don't want it in color. The future is defined by the young. Yeah, therefore, I encourage entrepreneurs with knowledge about experience with and big ideas and ambitions for Bitcoin to reach out to me and the others that see it. The bigger the dream, the more we listen, especially when those ideas have an industrial angle or can be, force, can be a force for good. We are not just going to wait for the future, we'll, we want to join in building it as well. Best regards, Kiel Inge Roque. P.S. I've written this letter and founded CETE in close collaboration with Ola Snove, 
who I've known and worked with for nearly 50 years. For nearly 15 years, he has contributed 10% of the capital and will be seated as executive chairman. Now, what I list, what I miss a little bit in this whole shareholder letters and or anywhere on cities or Arcares, uh, you know, sites or whatever, is you know the bigger, grander, uh, you know, vision uh, connected with ethos, connected with you know with the not only disruptive but really evolutionary uh, processes. Uh, would it be you know what what is really achievable? You know, not only of in in in, in terms of disruption and growth and the industrial, you know, all these keywords, but like what is the bigger picture? What is what is you know what is the true potential? Uh, once we root, you know, the the, the, the you know localized economies in in Bitcoin, when we decentralize, you know, all the, in, the centralized infrastructures, uh, what is possible with zero to one technological innovations? Once everything is rooted in Bitcoin, so. You know, a little bit like what would interest me, even even if it's from a personal angle, what is the bigger vision? What is the bigger perspective? I mean, if you know, I mean, if you have conviction and and trust and knowledge and comprehension of Bitcoin, it should be no problem to not make a, a prediction, but to make an assessment, to make a you know, to to draw a, a, a step by step process how this world will eventually you know evolve into and, and create abundance of prosperity for you know for not only ourselves but especially for our children and, and our grand and our grandchildren and, and children of our children anyway so i hope you uh, enjoyed this uh, reading of the shareholders uh, uh, letter by uh, by the chairman and founder of Aker, uh namely roque uh, kiel roque and uh, let me know if you have any questions, comments, remarks. Um, that was a pretty lengthy shareholders letter. I didn't want to read too many, you know, parts of it, so I'll put that in the show notes. So let me let me know what you think. I will, um, you know, stop live streaming now and go to the first part, which I didn't record for the podcast version. So thank you so much again for your. Uh, for your support, for your help, for your for, for your following me on Twitter, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast platforms. Follow me on Twitter, and if you have any suggestions for a one-on-one discussion, I already contacted City and Acker, um, hoping to get a uh, talk directly with uh, with the chairman and founder of Acker, or uh, and or panel discussion with other decision makers uh, in, in the new subsidiary of City. Uh, which is only Bitcoin holding investment uh, in Bitcoin. So thanks so much again. And uh, let me know what you think. This is the Kevin Devani connection. Thanks.